Welcome all. My name is Erman, and this is an introduction to Ethical Hacking course 2016-2017. Now before I continue any further, some of you might know me from the previous Ethical Hacking course, and this one will be significantly more advanced as opposed to that one. That being said, the requirements for this one will be also significantly different. But before we continue any further, <clears throat> let me just go over a few things. First of all, my throat is getting dry because this is like the fifth time that I'm attempting this and certain people, certain very rude people keep interfering. But anyway, there are a few considerations to make here. So first one is what can you expect to learn from this course? Well, you can expect to, I will show you basically how you can compromise systems, monitor the traffic in the air, fight against encryption, what you can do, what you can do with encrypted traffic, how you can, dec how you can attempt to decrypt it, uh, some of it you will be able to decrypt. I will show you various methods of positionizing like listening codes in the middle and how to take off certain layers of encryption and extract the useful information from the data which is out there in the air. I will show you various methods how to compromise systems in general, like PCs, servers, phones, smartphones that is. And we also might play around a little bit with the GSM network and see how and see some of the vulnerabilities there. That's a 2G network, so you have 2G, 3G, and 4G. 2G is the GSM and 4G is the LTE or LET, one of the two. I keep I keep messing around, I keep messing, I keep forgetting the order of the letters for some strange reason. Anyway, we will most likely, I will most likely at a certain point in time also talk a little bit about social engineering and you will see uh, the practical aspects of that as well. But there are a few, there are two primary considerations that you should make uh, when taking this course. So moral side of things, moral side of things and legal considerations. So just because you will be able to do something and I will teach you how to do some serious damage with the knowledge that you get you will be able to do some serious damage but that doesn't mean that you should and there really is no need for you to do so. But just think about it. You don't want anybody messing with your stuff, so don't mess with anybody else's stuff. There really is no real or justified reason for you to do, it, to do it. Legal aspects, legal considerations. In most countries, it is illegal to mess around with systems you don't have permission to mess around or systems that you yourself do not own. Just to give you a stupid example, uh, it's illegal to mess around with your neighbor's Wi-Fi. It's illegal to connect to it without that person's permission who owns it. So even these small, uh, I would say, negligible things are taken into consideration by law. Not to speak of breaking into the servers or taking information from the phones, personal information from the phones and other kinds. Uh, that's all covered as well. So you can get into a lot of trouble if you misuse the knowledge. I will give you a lot of knowledge here. I will show you how to do various things. Please do not abuse the knowledge. Use the knowledge. Do not abuse it. Okay, that being said, let's go over to the other side. Aside from the cute puppy up there that my friend Drew, sitting over there and smiling for some strange reason, doesn't want to come on the camera, God knows why, uh, you will have software and hardware requirements for this course. So those are, those are the two, well, you have three requirements. One is software, one is hardware, and the third one is uh, your current knowledge, your current amount of knowledge, so to say. Let's begin with the operating systems. So, Windows and OS X are completely incompatible for our purpose. On OS X, you lack a large amount of tools and you lack hardware compatibility in the first place. Even though you have a Unix Linux-like shell, uh, it's really not a system that you want to use for this purpose. Windows as well, Windows is even worse, and you don't have the degree of anonymity while using Windows is not really that good. With Linux, it's open source, 
you know all the traffic that's coming out and that's going in. You can monitor it. You know exactly what it is. All of it can be decrypted. With Windows, uh, you have un I, I've noticed a lot of unauthorized communication from my machines, and it's closed source. You don't know what's going on in the background. Don't know the source code. And you might say, well, you know, I know the source code of Linux, but I'm not, I'm not a developer. I have no idea what it means. It doesn't matter. A lot of other people know what it means. A lot of other people who make it, somebody would say something out there on the forums if there was something funny going on there. I don't know what's going on with Windows under the hood, and I don't know what's going on with OS X under the hood. And therefore, I generally don't like using them for anything unless I am practically forced to do so. My primary operating system that I use on my daily basis for productivity work, for pen testing and development is Linux. And it has the largest and it has practically the best tools for development and for pen testing. It doesn't matter which distribution you are using, you should be able to install pretty much all the tools on all the distributions out there. Anyway, uh, you will need a machine where you will have Linux installed. So we will need Linux as an operating system installed. I will show you, I will tell you which distro to choose, I will make a suggestion, and I will show you how to install it. Now, to answer your questions in advance, yes, you can have a virtual machine on Windows or OS X. Yes, you can have a bootable USB with persistent storage. And yes, you can have dual boot on Windows and OS X. All these three setups are First of all, you're going to encounter a lot of problems with dual boot with both Windows and especially OS X. Uh, Linux dual booting with OS X and Windows is a huge problem, especially with the UEFI BIOS. Some of you might argue and say, well, it's not. I've succeeded in doing it. Yes, I've succeeded in doing it. It works, but uh, it's a hassle to get it to work, or at least it was a hassle for me. The process is buggy. I can encounter a lot of problems. And a lot of your problems I cannot replicate. I do not know how to solve. I can't replicate them, therefore I don't know how to solve them uh, because these th the dual boot behaves differently on different machines with different biases. On different motherboards, that is. So have a machine which has Linux installed as a single operating system. All these other optional setups, like dual boot, live USB, uh, virtual machines, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and create these videos for you and I'll post them on YouTube as optional setups. But that's not the setup that I will be using. That's just something that I will post there for you so you can have a look. They will not be a part of this course at all. They will be on YouTube. They will be completely free. No need to register or anything like that. You can just, if you want, have that kind of setup. You can go and have a look at it, but I make no guarantees there. Okay, so in terms of hardware, first, of, first thing that you need to consider is driver compatibility. Uh, driver compatibility has been an issue for a very long time with Linux, but lately it hasn't been a problem almost at all because Linux nowadays supports pretty much most of the devices out there without any problems with open source drivers and open source drivers yeah, they tend to work like really, really, really well with most devices out there. There are still hiccups here and there, but it's it works. However, you will need to make sure that your system that you are using in terms of hardware components is compatible with the Linux kernel. You do this by basically getting the list of components of your PC and just typing in on the net like wireless card, lot number, drivers for Linux and it's going to tell you yes they do exist or no they do not exist and you type in like graphic card this graphic cards drivers for Linux yes they do exist or they do not exist so those are some of the checkups that you need to make in general if the drivers exist for I mean if you have drivers in one distribution and if they're open source you're going to have them pretty much all the distributions without any problems next up is really important so router access you will need access to your home router. You will need to be able to access it. Uh, most, a lot of ISPs these days, they tend to block the user access to the home routers. I don't know why they do this, most likely because they don't want a ton of people messing around with the configuration on the routers and they don't know what they're doing, so they mess things up and then they call support and it takes away valuable time and effort. 
it didn't cost them money, so they just lock the routers. But you, if you don't have access to your router, what you can do is just give them a call or write an email asking that you would like to have a permission to, that you would like them to unlock the router and they will tell you, okay, but you can do this at your own risk. Most likely if you mess something up, they will charge you some small amount to restore the original configuration. But you can basically back your router up once they unlock it, you can just create a backup file and you can use that as a restore point in case you do not know how to restore internet connection in your house. However, you will need access to your router because we're going to be configuring, uh, we're going to be opening up this machine to the outside world so it will be accessible from outside world. This will be necessary for certain setups. I will show you how to configure the router and the configure what you need to do is pretty much the same on every router. However, the interfaces on the routers will vary, but it's quite simple. It's quite simple. There isn't that much to it. Wireless cards. This is also something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, they need to be not only compatible with Linux, but they need to be compatible with Aircrack and Reaver. So Air, Aircrack dash ng and Reaver. Some Wireless cards function well, others do not. Uh, you can look it up on the net which ones do and which ones do not. In the final account of things, you can just go ahead and use the one that you have and see how it works out. Chances are that it will work, but again, some information that's the sort of information that you look up on the net. You, take, you see, first of all, you establish which chipset does your wireless card uses. You can do this by typing in the model of your wireless card on the manufacturer's website and the manufacturer will have the chipset listed there. Then you check whether that chipset has compatible drivers for Linux and whether that chipset is supported by Reaver and Aircrack-NG. All this information is listed on the sites. So you just use your favorite search engine and you, I assure you, you'll find these results without bigger difficulties. If you fail by some crazy chance to do so, just go with the flow and see what happens. See if it works out or if it doesn't. The CPU. Now the CPU that you have should support virtualization options. That means for Intel, you will need VT-D and for AMD, you will need AMD-VI. Uh, these are the flags which tell you that the processor is capable of virtualization. That's the simplest explanation I can give in that regard. Make sure that your, well, it would be nice if your CPU supported virtualization so that you can do everything that I do as well. How do you check this? Well, you go onto the manufacturer's website again and you see whether it supports it or not. You can even ask the manufacturer with an email, hey, does it support virtualization or not? Just give them a call or just give them a call, I mean, and ask them, quite literally, just give them the model number and they'll be able to tell it to you yes or no, without any problems really. Now, RAM, uh, it would be good if this machine where Linux will be installed will have at least four gigs of RAM. Linux doesn't necessarily require four gigs, it's going to run with un less than two gigs without bigger difficulties. It's not RAM hungry like Windows 10 OSXR. OS XR. But it would be good if you had more than four. Why more than four? For smoother operations of virtual machines, because we're going to have some of them that we're going to set up there and that we will use as our own small virtual servers, as our own pocket environments where we shall conduct, where we shall conduct our research and where we will, and the service which we will use in order to go through the course, we'll build our own environments where we will perform whatever it is that we need to do. USB. Have a USB lying around. Some USB. It need not be a big USB. It need not be a 3.0 USB or anything like that. Pretty much any USB stick will do. Uh, what you will need it for? Well, one of the basic things that we might need it for is, hey, I can show you how you can make a cryptographic key, uh, how you can convert your USB into a crypto key, when you plug your USB in into a laptop, it basically unlocks your, it unencrypts your drives and it unlocks your PC. 
and then you can add another layer of security on top of that and you can, it can request for a password confirmation as well. So that's really good security for you right there. In addition to all of this, uh, I will also show you how to monitor traffic, how to protect yourselves, how to secure your environment, uh, how to figure out what is going on in the network, where to post listening, where to listen for the, net, for the network traffic, how to figure out what is going on and such things. And in addition to all of this, my final thing that I would like to say here, that I would like to state here, is the disclaimer. I am not in any way responsible for what you do with the knowledge that I give you. I'm giving you this knowledge in good faith. This knowledge is presented here in good faith that you will use it properly and that you will not abuse it in any way. As all of this is for educational purposes so that you would gain knowledge, not so that you could mess around with your neighbor's Wi-Fi. I mean, just don't do that. <laughs> Quite stupid. You have nothing to gain and you can get into a lot of trouble for no reason of whatsoever. So, uh, that's it. I'm going to go ahead and bid you all farewell and wish you a download of luck with this course and I hope that we have a lot of fun as we go through all of these things. Welcome back all. So today I'm going to go ahead and show you how to make a, a live USB from which to boot off your Linux distro and, to and how to actually install it onto a machine. Now this is going to show you how you can install Linux onto a physical machine, not to dual boot or anything like that. I'm just going to perform the procedure in Windows and show you how it's done. So because I because I'm like guessing that most of you use Windows. So I'm just going to show you how to do it in Windows and Linux. This is very simple, but since I'm guessing that most of you will not start off by using Linux, I'm going to show you how to do it in Windows. And then we're gonna and then I will show you how to actually install Linux from that USB. So the very first thing that we need to do is download Fedora. And I have both of these windows open here, but let me just go ahead and close them and reopen Firefox. The very first thing that you will need is a Linux distribution. So Fedora. I have opted to go for a Fedora for a number of reasons. And I'm not gonna take the default download. I will scroll down and go into Fedora spins. And I will choose the one with the KDE Plasma desktop. I'm going to go ahead and click on download now and click here on download. Oh, by the way, let me just go back. Uh, yeah, okay, save it. But let me go ahead and go back. Can I? Yes, so when you come to the when you come to this page and when you click on download, download now, uh, you will you, as I've clicked before here on download straight away, it should recognize your system by default and offer you the 64-bit or the 32-bit version. In case you really want to check whether your system is 32-bit or 64-bit, you can go ahead and open up the file manager in Windows, right-click on this PC, go into properties, and it will say here system type 64-bit or 32-bit, either way. But as I said, it's probably going to detect it by default. Now, the file size is 1.2 gigabytes, so it might take a while for it to download. And I'm going to use this time to tell you why I chose this one and why am I downloading the KDE Plasma desktop. First of all, Linux as an operating system and as a desktop environment come in two separate packages. You have several desktops which you can use for the Linux operating system and you have God knows how many Linux distributions out there which function with a wide variety of desktop environments. So Linux is not like Windows where you are fixed, where you are pretty much condemned to a single desktop environment and they all look the same to me pretty much. Uh, it is said that there are no two same desktop environment, that there are no two same desktop configurations of Linux in the world. So everybody tunes it and tweaks it on end and KDE Plasma Desktop is configurable and customizable on end. For example, uh, I'm running a virtual machine here of Windows, but it it enables you to do this. You can't see everything that's going on on my other monitors, but you can see it's pretty cool. I mean, to do this in Windows would eat up your RAM uh, hilariously, but it allows you to do a lot of cool things. And this, 
The second reason why I've chosen Fedora is due to, well, the default desktop environment for Fedora is GNOME. I don't really like GNOME, but it's a fine desktop environment. There's nothing wrong with it, so you can download the default one as well. I have chosen the KD, and that's where I'm going to be doing the demos. Anyway, the second reason why I've chosen Fedora is because it is a convenient workstation distribution and for it's convenient for daily usage as well. Uh, I don't think that there is pretty much anything that you can do in Windows that you cannot do in Fedora. It's very, it's perhaps it's not the beginner's distro, but it's not really complex to use and it's very convenient, especially for our purpose. Why? Why for our purpose? Because it is very, it, because it's very secure. It uses, uh, it uses SC Linux. You have three, you have three security mechanisms. You have mandatory access controls, discretionary access controls, and you have a firewall. So the firewall controls all your incoming and outgoing traffic. Uh, discretionary access controls are user and group based access controls. So what's defining what certain users can do. And then on top of all of that, you have SC Linux, which provides for discretionary access controls, which specifically state what processes, what programs can do what and which files can they access. So if you run a program as a user, that program does not have the same permissions as the user that ran it. If it runs in SC Linux context, it has severe limitations of what it can do, which increases the security of the system exponentially. SC Linux was developed by NASA. If you're curious, I would strongly advise you to look it up on the net and just read a little bit about it. It's very interesting material. And then it was released and open sourced to the to the world basically for free and a Linux community has embraced it and used it ever since and it's a fantastic way of actually tightening down the security of your system and it comes configured and installed by default on Fedora which is awesome. Also since you're going to have this Fedora since you're going to have a Linux machine you need a distro where you can perform your daily work. Fedora is also great for that. Aside from all those things, Fedora is a Red Hat based distro and it is a Red Hat sponsored project. It contains all the latest technology that Red Hat is testing that they would later that they later on intend to implement into the Red Hat distros. It up, the new releases of Fedora are released very fast and it's pretty easy to update like if you're watching this course and if at a certain point of time like Fedora 24 comes out or 25 or 26 it's fine, just go and download that particular one. Just download the latest one. It shouldn't be a problem really at all. Uh, Fedora, why isn't it a beginner distro? Well, it tends to have certain glitches here and there. Some things don't tend to work out uh, because it's using bleeding edge technology. Uh, which is good for, which is also not not a bad thing for us because we need all the latest technology there which is relatively unstable but we still need it for the purpose at hand so sorry for making a bit of a longer talk here but i wanted to make it clear why i have chosen this distribution and what do you get with it also the distro is completely free to use uh next up you will need an image writer so type in raw Right with raw right with single W. 32, press enter. And the very first one, again, the very first one, click save file. This download will be very fast. And go ahead and start the exit file. Say yes here and click on install. Finish. There you go. The installation should be very, very fast. Now go ahead and type in uh, raw raw right start it excellent so it says file system image okay open uh, plug your USB in please uh, this is the time where we will need to plug your USB in uh, the USB should be four gigs or more I think four gigs should do just fine mine is four gigs here you can see that it's actually plugged in here you go it's yeah three 59, I think, something like that. You can right-click on it and format it beforehand. So that's not a bad idea. You just right-click and then format. And make sure that it's FAT32. 
which is going to be very nice. Also, I forgot to mention one more reason why Fedora is good, because it works rather well, it boots rather well on UEFI BIOS machines and non-UEFI BIOS machines. Both work just fine. Anyway, go into downloads here, and you see where it says here, compressed FS image, blah, blah, blah. Well, change that and select all files and then find your Fedora ISO image here where it has been downloaded. Okay, so I'm gonna pick this one and there you go. Calculating hashes, just wait for it to finish. Uh, you know what I'm missing now? You know when you call uh, an office somewhere and they give you that music while you wait? You should implement that in these videos seriously. Okay, file system image, it gives us the hash if we want to check it later, but not, probably should. Make sure that you select the right USB here and r click on write to disk. It's gonna ask you, are you sure you would like to write the loaded image to drive F, USB, blah, blah, blah. Attention, this will destroy all contents of the disk in that drive. Please be careful here. Uh, select the USB where you don't have any relevant data. In fact, if you're using a USB with data on it, make sure to back up that data, which is a reasonable thing to do. Click yes, and then just wait for the procedure to finish. It's gonna take a while depending on the speed of your PC, but it doesn't matter. I shall cut the tutorial here and come back when it is done. Okay, so welcome back. Now that the process is done, just close the program if it doesn't close in and of itself. Anyway, at this point in time, you have a bootable USB with Linux on it that you can plug in to pretty much any machine out there and you can perform the installation. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close, I'm gonna go ahead and shut this machine down. Uh, you don't, I mean, you can, you can shut it down or not, doesn't really matter. The physical machine where you install, where you intend to install the Linux, that is the machine where you need to plug your USB in. Now, take that machine that you reserved to install Linux on, plug the USB in, and you will be booting it and setting the boot order and installing Linux on it. I'm gonna do it on a virtual machine here as my main, my main machine is already Fedora. So, upon the boot of the machine, upon the boot of any machine, you will be prompted with a, uh, either to select the boot order or to enter BIOS. Now, on every machine, it is different. On this machine, there's nothing installed, and I'm guessing that the machine that you selected for has nothing installed on it either. But in case you have something installed on it, you need to press F12, F11, F10, or F2, or the delete button to select the boot order. You will see this option briefly before you actually boot into the operating system. So uh, just press one of those buttons and select the boot order that you would like. Select the, select the, state, that the machine, state that you would like it to boot from a USB. So afterwards, you will get a prompt exactly like mine. If it says here uh, 2025 or some next version that came out, it doesn't really matter. I was pretty sure that I downloaded 23, but I downloaded 24. It's completely irrelevant. Whether it's 23, 24, or the 25, which is to come, it doesn't matter. Just select, just when you download it, as I said before, just download the latest version and that's it. So here I'm going to go ahead and show you how you can install Fedora on Fedora Linux onto your uh, machine as your main op as your main and single operating system. So you select the first option, press enter, and then wait. Uh, Fedora will boot and install just fine on a UEFI BIOS based machine, just as it will on a legacy based machine. So going through this, okay, just wait for it to be done. It's doing its own thing in the back. And black screen for a while. Depending on the speed of your machine and well, just on the speed of your hard drive, this process might take a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, or be a little bit shorter. Keep in mind that you are doing this installation from a USB, so 
it can take a bit of time for it to actually complete. Okay, so booting and booting today, today, yes, please. Mm, thank you. So you will get a screen just like I have a screen here. I'm unable to get the full resolution until I actually have installed the system and configured it, but doesn't matter. I'm not going to be using this virtual machine. I'm just showing you how to actually install it. You will get a icon here. It says install to drive, to hard drive, and just double click on it and wait. Uh, okay, maybe. Yep, there we go. So it just takes a while for it to install. You can select your your language preferences here. I'm going to go ahead and state English, United Kingdom. Select whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Whatever suits you. I would suggest that you go with English always, as it is a lot simpler. I never understood why people actually translated the operating systems. When I go onto an operating system, which is uh, a friend asked me to help him out or something like that, and his OS is actually on my native language, I get lost completely. Not sure why. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on continue. So these are just some some personal preferences here. And then we're going to, you can configure the keyboard here additionally if you want, but I don't think that you need to since you selected the language, it's going to default to that keyboard. Uh, you can select a time zone, we'll basically just click on it and, I don't know, click anywhere on the globe and that's going to be fine. It really does, I mean, that's up to you, depending on where you are in the world. I've just set some time zone, it doesn't really matter. Uh, network, you will need to be connected to the internet, so it's, uh, it needs to say either wired or wireless and it needs to say connected. So if you're on a wireless network, just go ahead and click on it and you're going to get a prompt or something like that. If you don't, plug a cable into the machine and it's going to connect. Now it says here system. Well, maybe you don't necessarily need to be connected. I mean, if you don't have internet connection at the time of the installation, it should be fine. You can always perform certain updates later on. It says here installation destination, automatic partitioning selected. Okay, so, uh, sorry. You just click on it and open it up. You will get a series of disks here that you have available. I have this one available and when I click on it there's this uh, sign here and you select it and you can, you, you're, I mean there's no reason why you cannot just click on automatically configure partitioning and encrypt data. But if you have already an operating system installed here you can just click on encrypt data if you want to encrypt it. Uh, I usually do, but if you lose your encryption passphrase or if you forget it, you will never again be able to recover that data. They just forget about it. So you can either opt to encrypt it or not to encrypt it. I would personally advise you not to encrypt it for these learning stages as there is no need while you're learning to have all your drives fully encrypted. So you are just making it possible for you to mess things up. Later on, you can always reinstall the system or re-encrypt the drives while the system is actually installed if you want. But as I said, there is no need for it to do now at this point in time. Now you can also select uh, this, I will, conf you can also, you, well, I will configure partitioning and then select, I would like to, well, just select I will configure partitioning because I'm guessing your partitions won't exactly be free. So just select I will configure partitioning and then click on done. And it will throw you here. Uh, the first thing that you're going to do is, well, you can leave it at this. Just, no, I don't want to rescan the disk. Okay, so just click here, one storage drive selected, and see if that's the drive that you want it to be installed on. Okay, so go ahead and click on to plus, and you can create mount points here, etc. But the real reason why I actually brought you here is so that you learn how to actually make space available in case it is already occupied. So you can click on, click here to create a partitions in an automated fashion, and that's it. 
Uh, if you want to delete a partition or something like that, if you already have it occupied, you can delete it with a select it and there's a minus sign. Minus, 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 and there you go. You delete all of them and then you click here to create them automatically. Keep in mind that all data that is already contained on them will be lost and you can see it already has boot FE. They are configured. So all of these things are created here for you. You don't need to do anything special, especially not for the learning process. Just click on create them automatically. The only reason why I brought you here is due to the fact that your disks might be occupied so that you know how to delete them. You basically delete them with this minus sign. Then you click uh, here. Let me just do it one more time. So minus, minus, minus. And cr click here to create them automatically. And there you go. They're all created and click on done. And it's going to destroy something, which is fine for me. Keep in mind that after this point in time, I'm going to accept the changes. And when I click on begin installation, uh, these changes will become permanent. And your whatever information is contained in the installation disks will be gone without a good chance of a recovery. So uh, let's go ahead and create our user. I will just type in something nonsensical here like test, you should type in, well, you don't need to type in your name. It's an optional field. Uh, the username for me will be test, and I'm going to click make this user, well, actually, no. And I'm going to go ahead and create test down below and test down below. Uh, so everything will be test for me. You create the real username for yourselves, the one of your choosing, uh, put in a strong password, don't just type in nonsense here like I have because I'm going to delete this machine as soon as I have, uh, as soon as I'm done with this. And then click on done. You'll need to click on done twice because the password is weak here. You need to create a strong password and you will only click done once. Now let's go ahead and create the root password. I'm going to create a root password which is test again, which is kind of stupid, but oh well. Done, done, and there you go. Now create a good, strong root password and create a good strong password for your user. Uh, that is something that you should really do. I mean, yeah, don't type in test. That's pretty stupid. I did it because as I said, I'm going to delete this machine anyway. It doesn't mean anything at this point in time. I'm not going to use it for any sort of productivity work. Rather, instead, most of my work will be done on the machine that I already have that is already set up for me. So I'm going to do this work on a real machine, not on a virtual machine. I'm just showing you how the installation procedure goes on a, how the installation procedure goes. Okay, so let's, I'm going to go ahead and cut the video here and wait for the installation process to finish. You shouldn't be prompted with anything else. Okay, so now that the installation is done, you press quit. And then you uh, go and reboot the machine. Uh, okay, leave. Yep, leave. Restart the computer. Reboot. And wait for it to actually uh, begin the reboot process. Okay, now remove the remove the USB when it shuts down completely. Okay, just wait, wait, wait. A job is running for session one of user live user. One minute and 30 seconds. Okay, well, gotta wait. No big deal. We're probably gonna encounter something similar like this, so just wait for it. If it doesn't work out, you can always force shut down the machine. It doesn't really do any harm. The installation procedure is done anyway. And it's gonna finish today. Okay, let me see if I can... Uh... Nope. Can't grab it that way was kind of hoping for it. Okay, so one minute and 
oh, 15 more, 10 more seconds. So let's just wait for it, wait for it. And it's going to finish. You could have cut this part out, but I figured I would leave it in because you might encounter something similar and think that something went wrong. Okay, now plug the USB out. Plug it out completely once it shuts down and it's beginning to reboot. Okay, so now you actually have this menu and it says Fedora Rescue and Fedora 24. Uh, the rescue mode is when you mess things up and you can't boot, you go and re you can't actually boot into your system. So you go into the rescue mode and you attempt a repair from there, although it is somewhat limited. Okay, so let's boot it up and see what happens. And any time now, my friend, sometime today you will boot. Okay, it's coming about, it's going to become live. Some problems with the X server sometimes. Uh, it does tend to happen. Okay, let's type in my glorious password in. And booting. Okay, this is, will be one of the last tutorials that I'll do on this machine, then I'll switch to the other machine which has the same operating system installed uh, where I can actually do things as it is a physical machine. I can do things that I want to do. Okay, so today you shall boot. And there we go. It's fully installed, it's fully functional, and all is fine and dandy and well. Uh, so you can check the network connectivity here, sounds here, uh, this menu button you can click and then go into system settings, we'll find a lot of interesting things here, I'll show them to you later on. But yeah, the machine is actually booted and functional, now the, the installation has been completed, have the web browser Firefox, which we will need to configure to an extent but I'll show you how to configure it and what to do there. It doesn't really matter now. Uh, you also get the device notification updates here. You can see here notifications, clipboard, battery if you're in a laptop, device notifier. A lot of things are included by default in the KDE desktop running on Fedora 24 and a lot of things you already have in Fedora, which is fantastic. So we can just leave it at this. Uh, the next tutorial that you see will be on my physical machine from which I will conduct the rest of this tutorial, the rest of this course. The only thing, the only note, maybe the primary difference that you will notice is that the, that the background is different. So that's not really a difficult thing to do. You click on, you right click and go folder view settings and background color wallpaper type image, I don't know, you can select whatever you want, you can open something from the file system that you've downloaded from the net, etc. So I will debrief you on how everything works here, but more importantly, I will show you how to configure the, configure your browser, how to block the JavaScript, external JavaScript, uh, you, need, it need, it, you need to prevent it from remembering history and clean cookies on exit, uh, perhaps block ads if you want it. Uh, and then after that, we'll get into the firewall and traffic analysis, how you can monitor incoming and outgoing traffic, which is very important for you. And we'll take it on from there. So, bid you farewell. This was the installation of Fedora 24 demonstrated. Yes, I know I have 362 new updates. I'll show you how to update the system and how to configure it in the follow-up tutorials. You might think this is a little bit boring and unnecessary, but believe me, you want to go into this with a prepared and a secure system with an ability to analyze your own system and be familiar with it so that you can know what is going on with it. Video yeah, farewell. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and connect to a VPN. So how is VPN different from a proxy? Well, for one thing, VPN has heavy encryption between, it's a point-to-point -point encryption 
between the uh, VPN provider and you as a client. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and I would advise uh, using OpenVPN as opposed to the PPTP VPN. It's OpenVPN is generally better integrated with Linux systems. Uh, it goes, I do believe, under the GNU public license. So I'm going to go ahead and find some free uh, VPNs on the net and I'm going to go ahead and use them and then I'll show you what actually happens. Uh, the primary difference is that between me and the VPN provider, so between two points, uh, all traffic is encrypted. So whoever snoops between those two points cannot actually decrypt what is going on without having the ARSA keys that are needed. So uh, VPN is generally the best or the second best way to anonymize yourself on the net. And I'm going to go ahead and use a free one, but there are a ton load of paid ones, which are just amazing, which have fantastic speeds, stability, etc. Now, whether they keep logs or not, I don't know. I mean, you can take a look at their policies, etc. You can ask them, like pose a straight up question or something like that. But uh, there really is no guarantee because you have no way of knowing what the other person, what the person on the other end is doing. So let's go ahead and type in DNF uh, search open VPN. You can do this through the network manager in the GUI, but I don't really care much for that. I generally prefer to uh, do things through the terminal. So what you need is a open VPN uh, here. This is a client, so uh, DNF install open VPN. I don't need the x86 64. That's going to be uh, that's going to be placed there by default. You just need to type in actually open VPN. And now I'm going to go ahead and open myself a browser. And I'm going to go over to uh, open VPN free. Just see if I can find some free VPNs. And there is this service, the VPN book. Now I am going to use them, I'm going to use these free VPNs to actually do a demo, but there is no guarantee on my end that these servers are actually anonymous and that they don't actually keep any logs or anything like that. Uh, so keep that in mind. I'm just using this as a demo because I don't particularly care uh, at this point in time whether they keep the logs or not because I'm doing a demo. Uh, you should care and I make no guarantees for this service, just so you know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I really don't know. All that I'm saying is that you need to run the reputation checks for yourself. So there's the PPTP and OpenVPN. Now, you have the username and password here, and then you have the configuration files here. Now, you can download any, I don't know, any one of these, really. I'm going to go ahead and download the last one for Germany. That seems to be the closest to my location. I'm just going to go ahead and save this. Okay, save, file. Go ahead and click here. You'll be offered an option to actually extract it. Now, here in the extraction, you have the TCP443, TCP80, UDP, UDP53. I would just extract this one, honestly, and I wouldn't bother uh, taking the others at all. So I'm going to go ahead and state that I should that I shall like to extract this and I'll simply extract this here under my username. So home and then username. I'm going to go ahead and state OK. Then I'm going to go back to the terminal and I shall wait before I do. I'm just go ahead and type this what my uh, IP. OK, right. So it says here that I have one IP. And let's go ahead and type the following in as root open VPN dash dash config home your username. Uh, was it VPN? No, let's go ahead. Just pre keep pressing tab. Oh, VPN book, right? So VPN book, and I only have one in there, so I'm just going to go ahead and use tab completion. 
I'm going to press enter. It's going to ask me for the username. Now I have the username and the password on the other screen, but I've shown you where they are on the website. So it's VPN book. I'm kind of lazy. I'm not going to type them in. I'm just going to copy paste both, both of them. And it's going, it's going, it's going. Uh, just give it some time. Initialization sequence complete. You are looking for this line. Now just press Control R in your browser to refresh uh, the site. What is my IP? And well, you need I should actually shut the browser off. But I mean, yeah, you should actually uh, close the browser and close close any programs that you have which have open connections and then reopen them after you have initialized the VPN. But for the sake of the demo, I just wanted to show you how the IP address changes here. So it says your IP address is 178.160.193.233 in Germany. I can tell you for sure that I'm not actually in Germany. Great place, but I'm not there at the moment, especially during the Oktoberfest. Oh my God. Anyway, it says, what is my IP? And I can guarantee it to you, this is not my IP. This is from the VPN provider. Okay, so uh, this is a very nice way of anonymizing yourself, especially if you have a paid VPN. Uh, you are very safe. Uh, I mean, if you go to a country where you have bans, etc., you might want to configure your VPN prior to actually entering that country because entering a country before you've configured the VPN, it, it's still doable, it's just a little bit trickier because a lot of the domains where you get the config files for the VPNs are banned, are actually censored. But in any case, uh, this is how you would change it. The encryption between me and this point in Germany exists and anything in between cannot actually see what I'm doing. So your ISP, your ISP provider cannot actually, does not know what it is that you are doing on the net. The person that does know what you are doing on the net is the owner of this VPN server. Anyway, gonna bid you farewell here and in the follow-up tutorials, I will, sh I will show you how to set up your own VPN server and what the person on the other end can see. Okay, so uh, bid you farewell. Welcome back all. So today I'm going to go ahead and show you how you can anonymize yourselves by using the Tor network. And in all likelihood, I will also show you uh, how to actually set up the Tor nodes yourselves so that you know what the person on the other side can actually see. But it's not quite as simple with the Tor as it is with proxies. Uh, first of all, because you are never going through a single hop in the Tor network like you are doing so with a proxy. Well, with a proxy, you can choose whether you wish a single hop or whether you wish multiple hops to occur or whatever. But uh, if you are attempting to basically access, uh, the, to access the internet through Tor, to some website, I don't know, let's say YouTube, uh, you will go to an entry node, to entry guard, and then you will go through the middle somewhere, and then you will go through the exit node. So at bare minimum, you will always go through three nodes, which each each node will uh, be able to only decrypt a portion of the of the traffic, with the exit node decrypting the last portion and actually going somewhere. So in the Tor network, the entry point actually sees who is using it and the exit point sees where the traffic is going. But you, at the end, the exit node cannot know, does not know who is making the request and the entry node does not know what the content of the request actually is. It just knows who is making it. Anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and set this up. So what I'm going to show you now is how to use a Tor browser, not how to use a Tor as a service. Tor as a service, I do believe that in all likelihood I'll show that in some later on. So uh, just type, uh, oops, uh, just type in DNF install Tor browser. Is it spelled that way? Uh, no. 
how about this no okay no big deal dnf search tor grep dash i browser and it's tor browser launcher okay let's just go ahead and copy that dnf install and it's already installed so there is nothing to do now a keynote here do not i mean do not run the tor browser as root in fact you shouldn't run any browser as root that's universally that's universally a stupid thing to do and you really shouldn't run it as root. I mean, you can run it for some testing purposes or whatever, but generally, uh, as in 99% of the time, that is an extremely bad idea. I've actually seen on the net a lot of tutorials with Kali Linux, and a lot of people seem to be running uh, Tor as root and are showing other people to run, instructing other people to run Tor, Tor and any other browser as root, not actually... Uh, explaining the consequences of doing so. If your browser, by any chance, gets exploited by anything, that certain exploit will have root privileges on your system, which will be hilarious. So, yeah, just kind of don't do it. And down below, it's a normal user, so Tor browser uh, like this. No, Tor uh, browser launcher you're killing me here okay so ls bin grep dash i tor it's tor browser launcher how am i misspelling this uh tor browser launcher there we go so hey by the way if one of your executables programs like this don't work Take a look in the bin. Take a look in the bin directory, like I did. I listed everything in the bin, bin directory, and then I grepped the ones that be, that contained the word "tor" in them. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and launch the Tor browser. It says here connecting to the Tor network, and it's establishing the series of nodes. And it opens up and pops like this. If you use full screen, it's going to give you a warning that. The devices might actually, the D sites could actually determine the monitor size, which in turn can be used to track you, etc. But that's not that big of a deal, just saying. Uh, you have no script here enabled, so that's going to block some of the JavaScript depending on how it is configured. Now, what can you do with a Tor browser? Well, let me go ahead and show you. I'm gonna go ahead and display in parallel. Uh, well, for one thing, you can browse the dot .onion domains, which you cannot actually access from the regular net. No way you can do that. So let me go ahead and type in here, what is my IP? And let me go ahead and type in down below, what is my IP? Okay. Uh, no, no, I don't want to open up a site. Doesn't really matter. So here it says like some IP that belongs to me. And the other one is uh, God knows where. So I wonder what anonymous proxy where would they where where did I actually exit? Which exit node did I use? Huh, it would seem that I have uh the, the site seems to be broken. Okay. Uh warning to you, a lot of sites some of the sites won't actually work properly with the with the with the Tor browser, so keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so I gotta, I gotta disable a lot of things in order to be able to load this, but, well, not a lot of things, just a few things, I guess, but, ah, uh, come on, I almost had it. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, your IP address is something here, and the host name is apparently this, so that's the host name of the Tor exit node, I guess. 
or your organization is that browser is recognized. Ah, there we go. So I'm exiting somewhere in Garden City in United States in the state of New York. I can assure you that at the moment I am not there. I'm very far from it. I'm across the Atlantic in Europe. So my IP address has completely changed, which is convenient. And by the way, during the time that you are browsing the net, this IP address can actually change. Oh my God, it just has. Anyway, uh, the IP address can change. It can go back and forth. You can have one and then you can have another and then you can go back to that one. And it is very likely that it will actually change because there are multiple exit nodes and you will be using multiple exit nodes because, well, you won't be using them simultaneously, but you will be jumping from one to the other. And depending on the load, there are load balancers in place. So depending on the load and the nodes, you will be going back and forth between the nodes. So your IP address will be in a constant state of flux, which attributes a great deal to your anonymity. Now, uh, before I used to show people the basically the you just press Control B to get the bookmarks, but I've actually uh, it actually comes bookmarked here. Okay, so the hidden wiki website URL it's something like this blah 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 dot onion. Uh, these domains they will have random strings and. They are completely random streaks, and it says dot onion. I wonder what would actually happen if I was to generate a ton load of these random strings and just try to open each and every one of them, just to see and explore. And it actually that would be a that would be a good project. Uh, maybe I will do it. That doesn't matter. In the hidden wiki you have a certain set of websites which are published here, which are on the hidden net. And you have all sorts of things. I would advise you never to buy anything here, never to post any sort of personal information on any of these sites. Uh, just just a friendly advice. And but you can what I what I what I like the most about the about the hidden wiki are the links to certain forums. And you get some really nice forums here that you can get a lot of answers from. Uh, Technical, technical things that some of them which are not published on the net or on the regular net or some of the answers which you won't actually get on the regular net because people won't tell you, etc. You also have a lot of bad things like the drug market and stuff like that, but that's completely irrelevant and besides the point. Anyway, I advise you never to actually run your credit card here. Definitely, actually definitely don't use your credit card here for God's sakes. That's such a bad idea. And don't, I would advise you not to actually register any sort of personal information. But uh, I generally use Tor to actually, I mean, to when you want to be hidden or when you want to bypass certain regulations of the country, uh, you would be able to use it and then go out onto the net, but also visit the hidden, the, the dot onion domains, which you cannot access on a regular basis. Uh, but it all comes down to trust, whether you trust the people running the tour nodes. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and bid you farewell here and hope to see you in the follow up or the next tutorial, whatever that might be. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to go ahead. Today, I'm going to go ahead and show you how you can set up your own proxy in the cloud somewhere and how you can configure it to allow other people to use it as a free proxy and how you yourselves can actually connect to it and use it as a free proxy as well. And then you will see what sort of information will be obtainable, what the other person controlling the proxy will be able to see and what sort of information will you be able to see. So uh, for this purpose, I'm going to go ahead and use DigitalOcean. I've, I've been using them for a while for a lot of other stuff anyway, so I might as well use them for this as well. Anyway, uh, oops, my keyboard. So you don't need to use that. You can use anyone. 
uh, any provider whose policies allow you to run a proxy, uh, you can go ahead and host it there. So you don't, I am not advertising them or advocating that you should actually go there. I really don't care which provider you use. If you use any, you can just sit back, relax and see how this actually happens. You don't even need to do it yourselves. But as I said, uh, it is it is it is completely up to you who will you use and as you can see i already have some active connections here to my servers so you will need to like register on the site and all that if you want but you, you will need to register on any site so as i said use anyone that you want i really do not care it doesn't matter they're pretty it's pretty cheap hosting anyway okay uh logging in so yeah uh first i have a lot of things blocking here and so will you that's why the site might like be a failure to load or something like that but it should be fine in general it should load eventually i have at the moment i have three servers that are running and that are operational here oh man come on okay so this part where it says blah blah loading uh it shouldn't actually be lasting this long i do not understand what is the matter with this thing is it seriously the ad locker uh disable everywhere let's just go ahead and reload the site amazing it's the ad locker that's preventing the site from actually loading properly anyway so i do have uh three instances here and i'm gonna go ahead and uh, delete them because I, I've only created them for the purposes of this tutorial anyway. And then I'm gonna show you how you can create a new one. So destroying, destroying. Oh, which one did I destroy? Two, one, oh wait. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, Yep, I destroyed the one that the Tor node was running on where I was doing experiments for the setup of the tour nodes for the for the other tutorials. Oh well, no big deal, I'll just recreate it. Once you destroy it, that's it. No going back. Sorrow and tears, but it's all going to be gone. Ah, oh, God, come on. Yeah. Okay, so you click on Create Droplet, the green button at the top, and then you can select the type of a server that you would like to run. Uh, I don't know. I have a tendency to select either Debian or CentOS. So usually one of the two I like to select. Depends what I am doing. If I need a server for virtualization, I am going to always go with the CentOS. If I need a server for uh, just some sort of web hosting or a proxy like this or whatever, I'm going to go ahead and go with uh, the Debian in general. You select Debian and then you select the version, select the latest version, and then select your monthly budget for this instance. I really don't care. I'm just going to select the five bucks here because it is completely irrelevant to me. I don't need a lot of, uh, I don't need it to actually work hard and strong or anything like that. This is just for the demo purpose. And the country, well, let's Let's select something close. So Frankfurt is probably the closest to me. And okay, so you are at the point of time where you can add your own SSH keys and you can select how many droplets you wish to be created. Now you don't strictly need to add an SSH key, but here's the, here's the thing. Uh, DigitalOcean or pretty much any other service provider is going to send you the password to your email and the password will be hilariously long. And I don't think that you'll be able to actually copy paste it. Uh, and that's gonna, I don't like using very long passwords for SSH logins, which might seem stupid to you, but it's really not. You take something that's even longer, which is an ARSA key, which is ridiculously long, and then you store it onto a system, restrict access to the file, and just use it to log into the server, which is an awesome way of uh, actually managing. Actually, it is the recommended way of uh, logging into the servers. So what I am going to do here, uh, okay, these, uh, these terminals are completely dead. 
I'm just going to go ahead and close the windows and I'm going to go ahead and show you how you can generate your own RSA keys, so public and private keys, so that you are able to log into these servers in a secure fashion. So you, you, if you want to use a different machine to log into these servers, you're going to need to actually copy these keys onto that machine. And uh, this is the RSA keys. The, the SSH in general is mainly like a Linux and a Mac thing. Can work on Windows as well uh, with PuTTY. But let's just go ahead and begin with this procedure. So you type in SSH-keygen-t RSA. Uh, Gen. Okay, you don't need to type in anything in particular here. You can type in a specific file where would you like to save it, but the default location is fine. So it's uh, the home folder, your username, and then .ssh. Just press enter. Uh, you're not going to get this, but I already have an RC key from my previous droplet, so I don't really care. So I'm going to go ahead and overwrite that. Uh, you can also add an additional passphrase to this, but uh, I'm not going to do that. There's really no need. I just press enter twice and you shouldn't really show these things to anyone, you know, your private keys or whatever, but I don't really care. This is just for the demo purposes. And once I'm done, I will destroy these keys and I will destroy this instance anyway. So you type in CD slash home, uh, your username and then dot SSH and then do LS and you will see it says idrsa, idrsa.pub, and known hosts. So I'm going to go ahead and type in vim, known hosts. So these are the known hosts which have been remembered. And there are uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, let me just go ahead and quit. You can also modify the known hosts file manually. I'm going to just, I'm just going to go ahead and purge it. Uh, so I don't have any hosts that I have actually remembered because RSA keys are specific to an IP. Once you generate the SSH RSA keys, they're specific to an IP address. Even though the IP address can change, you will get a warning stating that the IP address has changed and then there is a possibility of a man in the middle attack. But usually it's not a problem. It's just that the IP address has changed. Anyway, do LS again. And you have ID RSA, so that's we're not going to touch that. But we have ID RSA pub, and that is the one that we actually need. So just go ahead and type in cat ID RSA dot pub. Great, I've just displayed my private key, but as I said, it really is irrelevant because I'm going to go ahead and destroy this machine afterwards anyway. ID RSA. That's that's one of the that's. That's that's what I'm doing basically. I've created a setup, I've created an environment, I've created everything for you so that I can do the full demo where I don't need to actually hide or conceal any sort of information. Rather, instead, I can just show you everything and then just afterwards I'm gonna destroy it and create a new system. Okay, so cat id underline arsa.pub. That's your public key. So press enter and you can just go ahead and copy the whole thing go back to the website and it says add your SSH key. So there is my key which I have added previously for the other instances but I'm just gonna go ahead and say that I would like to import a new key here and I'm gonna name this one new key. The name is arbitrary, you can name it anywhere you like. Add an SSH key and click create down below. You are not gonna need anything else. Okay so this is uh, creating the process is fairly fast even if you pick a bigger one it's still uh, very fast. It would seem that all of the disks that they offer are SSD disks, which is kind of nice. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot log in or do anything like that until this process actually completes. I'll just, 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 just wait. And then we need to, oh, okay, let's get to work. It's done. So I have the IP address. Ah, they have a copy button. Thank you. And uh, let me just go ahead and clear the screen. CD clear the screen again and type in SSH, it will be installed by default. Root at control shift V, press enter, type in yes. So the, authentic the authenticity of the host cannot be established. It has some sort of fingerprint, which is not matched by anything in your known host file because we've just purged the known host file. 
And yep, our known host file now contains this IP address and the fingerprint here. Okay, so we are logged into the machine. And if I type in ifconfig, you can see that the IP address is uh, whatever this is. And if I type in ifconfig down below, you will see that the IP address here is completely different. So this is like a, my private LAN IP address, while this here is a public IP address, which can be used to actually access this via the net. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is actually uh, start configuring our machine for the proxy. First things first, we're not gonna we're gonna need another user. So add user and the name of this user. You can it's arbitrary. You can put whatever you want. I'm gonna go ahead and name my use my user proxy. Uh, no, I'm gonna name my user sheep. So this user name will be sheep. Uh, should I add something? Nah, you can only use lowercase letters if I'm not mistaken. Enter a new Unix password for the user sheep. So just enter it, even though it won't be displayed on the screen. Okay, so enter the new value for the user full name. Don't care. Room number. Don't care. Work phone. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Is this information correct? Yes, it absolutely is. Thank you. So. These are only options that you can fill for the user. They're not mandatory things. I mean, if you just press enter onto an empty field, it's going to be fine. So if I type in su uh, sheep, I shall become a sheep. If I type in su, oh God, don't do this to me. Ah. I don't know the root password. I didn't get actually get it via mail. I probably did get it via mail, but uh, I didn't actually bother to check because I used the key to log in. So I don't know the root password. I, sh I need to actually change the root password. Uh, sudo su. Oh, God. Okay, let's just log out and log back in. This was this was like extremely stupid. Just type in exit and then uh, oh, okay. I don't need to actually log out. I just exited back. So I am back as root and let's type in pass WD and change the password for root for God's sakes. Uh, let's just type in something. I don't know. It's just whatever. Make sure you don't forget it. So I've created a new user. I've updated the password for root. And now I'm going to go ahead and edit my SSH settings. So VIM, do I have VIM? I do. Excellent. I'm so happy that VIM comes to installed by default on Debian. It still doesn't come installed by default on Fedora, unfortunately. VIM slash etc SSH SSHD config. Press enter. And this is the config file for SSHD. Uh, so we're just going to need to change a few things here for the sake of security. So permit root login. That is the line that we are looking for. Uh, permit root login. And just go ahead and just type this in without, without password. Okay, so right, right quit. And now just type in service ssh restart service sshd restart and then type in exit you're back in your host client and now go ahead and attempt to log back in as root and there you go so we have actually managed to log it log back in uh We've managed to log back in as a root user, but I shouldn't have been able to do that. I'll just see the config file one more time. I'm typing something wrong here. And let me just uh, probably a spelling type typo or something like that. Need to reload the service again.
Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's just go ahead and uh, set this to straight out no. And that should do the trick, basically. Ah. And there we go, it actually now requests for the root password, it doesn't go over the keys, so if I type in the password, Okay, so permission denied, even though I did type in the right password. It's The password is basically test123, uh, or lowercase t, it has to be one of the two. But it doesn't actually work, I can't log in. So let's just go ahead and try one more time. I know for a fact that this is the password, because this is something that I've designed to actually put the weak passwords in. If I type it in again... And it says, permission denied, please try again. Here, let me just type it in with a capital letter. And, uh, nope. Let me just write it one more time for charms. And, nope, permission denied. But, if I do this, sheep, it's going to ask me for a password here. It's the same password, test123. And there you go, I am able to log in. But the problem is I am not able to log in by using the keys. So I just need to copy the public key, which I have actually generated here. And I need to type in sudo su. Uh, sorry, just su. And there you go. The password is in fact test one, two, three for sure. Okay, let's clear the screen and do cd, c oh, shouldn't have done the cd, cd slash home, uh, uh, cd slash root ls dash a, cd dot ssh ls authorized keys, so cp authorized keys to slash home slash sheep dot s uh, s oh, I need to create the file first sorry uh, mkdir slash home slash sheep dot s s h and now I'm gonna go ahead and cp authorized host to slash home slash sheep dot s s s h and now I'm gonna go into slash home slash sheep and I will type in ch own uh, sheep colon sheep dot s s h and I will give the recursive here because I wish to change the ownership of this. I'm going to type in exit, exit, and I'm going to attempt to log in. And there you go. Voila. You don't need a password anymore. You can just log in with keys. And what have we done here? Let's just cap up before the time runs out. I have re removed the root user from the direct SSH login, so you can no longer log into the server as root. You can log in with a regular user and then become root on the server from that regular user. Otherwise, you can't. So it's an extra security layer and you cannot log in as root to the server. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and set up the proxy, but we're going to do that in the follow-up. Welcome back, everybody. So today, we're going to go ahead and begin the wireless chapter. Now, what are we going to do here today? Well... The very first thing that we that I was planning on showing you was how to utilize Aircrack in combination with the GPUs in your PC in order to accelerate the cracking of the VPA, VPA2 passphrase. You can use the CPU, which is considerably slower by orders of magnitude than the GPU for this purpose. So we're going to go ahead and perform a capture. So we'll capture a handshake between a device and an access point. An access point is your wireless router, 
and a device can be pretty much anything that can authenticate to the wireless access point. Uh, it can be a phone, a laptop, uh, these days it can be a, it can even be a refrigerator for crying out loud, but oh well. And we're gonna basically, what we will do is start, scan the area, then select our router, and select the device that is connected to that router, we will deauthenticate that device which is connected to the router, and once the device actually attempts to re-authenticate, we will capture that handshake that occurs. And then we will actually take that handshake and begin the cracking process by using the acceleration provided to us by the GPUs. Now, I understand that no, that people don't have GPUs just lying around doing nothing. Uh, I personally have three GPUs in my in my PC. One of them is used for the host system, that is the display wall graphics, basic from Fire Pro series from AMD. And it's basically designed to just plug in as many monitors as you can. It basically has six mini display ports, which is awesome. And I can plug all my four monitors into it. The other two graphic cards are Asus manufactured from NVIDIA. They are GTX 970s. And I primarily use them for gaming. So I have passed those two graphic cards to two different virtual machines on which me and my friend play some games. Uh, what I'm going to do today is repurpose those graphic cards. And uh, if you don't have them, just sit back, relax, and watch, see what happens and how it goes. You can perform the same type of an attack with a CPU, although it will be considerably slower. But I did, I did want to show you how you can use the GPU acceleration for this purpose. And today I'm going to repurpose them. I will pass both of them to a single machine and both of them will be utilized by a single machine where the cracking process will take place. Now, uh, the very first thing that we need to do before we go about installing the crack, uh, messing around with the MAC addresses, etc., we will need to confirm that our wireless adapter, that our wireless card can actually be used for this purpose, that it is compatible. So the very first thing that you need to do is type in IF config to see if you actually have a functional wireless card, and I do. So it's listed right here. Your name might be a little bit tennis. Okay. Uh, your name might be a little bit different, but I seem to have two of them. One from my uh, one from my PC and the other one that I've actually plugged in. Now the the one that I've actually plugged in, well, why did I do that? Because the one that I already had was completely incompatible for the purpose. Therefore, I had to plug in another one. I've tried a lot of things uh, with the one that was already there. As you can see, LSPCI, uh, LSPCI, what was the name? Yep, grep network. Sorry, ignore case. As you can see, it's Broadcom Corporation BCM4360. Now, this absolutely is incompatible for the purpose at hand, so I decided not to actually use it. Rather, instead, I've decided to use the one that I've actually plugged into my PC. I've just bought another one, USB, somewhere from eBay. They're pretty cheap, so they can be acquired. So you can see it here, LS USB. And it should be somewhere around here. Uh, Realtek. Yep, there we go. So Realtek Semiconductor RTL8188RU VLAN adapter. So that's the one that I've plugged in via USB, and that is the one that I will be utilizing. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear the screen. Well, actually, let me just go ahead and show you how you can run this verification. You just basically do this listing LSUSB and take the chipset. So just go ahead and copy it. And now I would like to ask you to open up Firefox or whatever browser you are using. And you can go over to air crack hardware ability <clears throat> and it should be the very first link that pops you can just keep on scrolling down 
And here you're going to see a lot of them. So it says Atros, ATM, Yell, Centrino, and the other ones. This is real text, so let me just go ahead, control F, and do this. Okay, so real tech, 818, yes, yes, unstable driving patch required. Okay, but which one do I have? Uh, 8188, so okay, it says RL8185, 8187. I know that it's supported even though I can't find the listing here. I know that it's supported because I have tried it before plenty of times. But even if your card is not actually listed here, uh, it's fine because, I mean, it's not fine. It might work and it might not work. So keep that in mind. Uh, there is a, you should be able to find additional information on this site, but it's not, like, it's not, it's not the definitive list of what works and what doesn't work. Your card might still work regardless. As you can see, mine is not listed here. I swear it was listed somewhere around here. But it doesn't matter, I've actually uh, went out onto the forums and asked in regard to the compatibility and then I have basically confirmed that it works and so when I've confirmed that it works I have, uh, I have bought it and I have installed it. So once you have confirmed that it works, if it's not listed there, if your chipset is not listed there, try going out onto the forums and asking people whether a certain card will work. Now, don't ask me whether that card will work because I genuinely do not know. I don't know because I don't have the card to actually test it out. But somebody on the forums might actually have tried something with that card and they can tell you their experiences. It does work or it doesn't or it partially works. If it partially works, that's a pretty bad thing for you. <laughs> don't bother with it. If, uh, if only in the case that people have confirmed that it's working, use it. If they, if, if it's not, then you're bound to encounter a ton load of errors. Anyway, let's go about installing the aircrack. So just type in DNF install aircrack dash ng. And yep, dependencies resolved, nothing to do. It's already installed. Uh, yours won't be, so for you the installation will go through, eventually it will ask you to say yes or no, you can just type in Y for yes. And the next thing, the next tool that I would like to install is Mac Changer. So Mac Changer, yes I would like to install it. And this shouldn't take a long amount of time, it should be fairly quick. So there we go, installed, Mac Changer, complete. Why are we installing the Mac Changer? Well, your devices, your wireless devices, your network devices, pretty much all these devices all around, they have their own unique Mac addresses by which they can be identified. So you definitely, I, I mean, generally, you would want to change your Mac address so that the trace wouldn't lead back to you in general. Although if somebody is, for example, performing the triangulation at the time of your, at the time of basically somebody doing something funny on the network, they will be able to determine the position of the person doing it within four square meters, which is not extremely helpful, especially if you're at a bar full of people who are all using laptops. <laughs> anyway, so uh, if you wish to change the MAC address, you can just type in MAC changer dash r and let me just do this i have config i'm actually not sure which one of these is it i'm pretty sure it's the first one and not the second one they can be recognized by the mac addresses these are the mac addresses here embedded so mtu 1500 100 uh Oh well, we'll see. One of them will work, one of them won't. I purely doubt that you're going to have more than one wireless card in your machine anyway. So, we'll get to that point in time. But if you type in Mac changer dash dash help, you will get a large listing of options here. Well, maybe not that large, but 
it can print the MAC address and exit. And that's what we're going to do. So which one was it again? Just show. You will need to specify an interface, of course. So VLP uh, D. So VLP 14S 0U. 314S0U2. And there you go. It actually gives the current MAC address, which is the one that is displayed, and the permanent MAC address, which is the one placed there from the hardware manufacturer, and this is the one that I actually need. As you can see, it actually is able to identify the manufacturer and the type of the device by the by the MAC address. So this one it says Alpha. Uh, that's the Alpha wireless adapter that I got from the eBay. But if I type in the other one, VLP 10S0, it doesn't actually know the manufacturer, I don't know, maybe because it's not listed or something like that, it's Broadcom, but probably just doesn't have the MAC addresses in the sheets. Okay, so uh, we are going to use the dash R, which is the random flag, and uh, could not change the MAC address interface up or insufficient permissions device or resource busy. Well, that's perfectly fine. We can just type in if config. I'm just going to use this one, the, the depreciated command, VLP 10S, uh, 10S0, because I really don't feel like learning the new one, and I don't like the formatting. I did want to, I mean, I know how to use it, but uh, the IP, and it does give advantages over if config. but for you, I figured that the best output format would be given with if config so that you could see things a little bit clearer on the screen. So 14S0U2. Uh, this is the one that I wish to change, not the upper one. Okay, I need to use it for the Mac changer, sorry. Mac changer dash R. And it cannot change it because the interface is up. So let's go ahead and type in if config VLP 14S0U2 down. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, enact this change. And there you go. It says permanent Mac is blah, blah, blah. And the new Mac is this one. So you have successfully changed it. If I type in if config uh, up. And I can just type in the listing for this address. And as you can see, the MAC address has effectively been changed and altered here. So that is the very first step that we are going to do here aside from the installation. Now the next thing that we need to do is just type in airmon-ng and press enter. This is going to give you the name of your wireless card. So here it says uh, Broadcom. I don't need that one. That's the first one. I'll actually disable it in BIOS because it's completely useless. And I have uh, this one, which I would like to use. So you get this is the this is the name of the device. So we're going to be using that one. And if we want to basically uh, be sure that no other processes will interfere, and we do want to be sure that no other processes will interfere, we need to type in Airmon ng check. Oh, we got quite a bit of processes that might interfere, and this is nothing, uh, nothing strange. You will have this as well. Now you can, you have the PIDs here, so you can do manual kills. Just type in kill and then the PID, or you can do uh, check kill. And this is going to help you in some cases, but more often than not, it's actually not going to do much for you. What you need to do is actually manually kill these. So 97, 41, uh, 97, 47. Don't, don't, don't miss the numbers. You might kill a process that you don't want to kill. So just make sure. Uh, and 749. Okay, perform a check one more time. Okay, no interfering processes found. Once you once you start the manual kills, make sure to kill the network manager first. Uh, don't worry about uh, killing these processes just by rebooting the network. System CTL 
restart network this should be fine to bring everything that needs to be a backup a backup and running with this command or you can just reboot the entire system okay now that we have established that uh, our the name of our wireless card the that we have actually killed all the interfering processes changed the mac address to increase our anonymity level we are going to basically begin the scan process next and then begin the capture process. And that we're gonna do in the follow-up. Welcome back all. So I have created myself a new file called, new directory called wireless where I have actually moved all the captured files. Now mine is called to crack zero one, yours could be called something else, I don't know, depending on how you've named it. Anyway, so we have two general methodologies for the brute force. You can use the CPU, which we're going to use first, and then you can use the GPU, which we are going to use second. You will notice that the GPU process is a lot faster. But before we can actually get into all of that, we need something to generate passwords for us. Now you can download these enormous word lists, which is a if you're using a word list then it's actually called a dictionary attack if you're using if you're not using a word list then it's called a brute force attack i personally prefer prefer a modified version of a brute force attack where i myself specify parameters uh to the password generating algorithm which then in turns generates passwords which are likely to be used in my environment because if you download a dictionary uh somewhere from the net a file you can never, I mean, you can never make one dictionary that's universal to the world. I mean, that would be huge. So I generally just like to implement a series of rules when generating passwords and then use those passwords. Now, uh, there is a bit of a downside to this as the process is a little bit slower, but not by that much. But you will see how it actually works on a GPU and how it actually works on a CPU. You will see the difference. It's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and do download and install our uh, program for generating passwords, which will be Crunch. So Crunch Password Generator. And some of you might tell me like that you know, all of this already exists in Kali, and why do I bother installing it on Fedora? Well, Kali is not really a distro which you can use on daily basis. I mean, Fedora is. Fedora is basically a workstation distro. And plus, on top of that, you actually learn a lot of things by just installing and configuring things manually as opposed to having them installed and configured there by somebody else. So just download Crunch 3.6 TGZ. Uh, the download shouldn't take long. It's fairly small. And no, no, thank you. I do not wish to subscribe. Ah, today, my friend. Today, I beg of you. I've already downloaded it, actually. It should be should be in the... Oh, wait, I've, I've actually deleted it. Or have I? Okay, this is nothing to do with me, quite literally. This is the problem on the site. I do not know why is it taking so long. Maybe, okay, it's able, enabled the, this actually blocks the Java, co Java code, which I've showed you. Okay, let's attempt this one more time. Ah, uh, there we go. So save file, this they're only temporarily disables it, but I can re-enable it anyway. And I can go ahead and just click on it and state that I wish to extract this. So I will extract to, I don't know, let's say documents, sure, why not? And close this, no thank you, goodbye. Okay, so. If I just go CD and, well, actually, let me just give you the full path. So my, you go to the home directory and then you type in your username 
and then you type in documents and then you type in crunch and then you will be in the folder. So you have a good amount of files here. You just need to basically type in make and then make install and that's it. That's literally it. Uh, it you don't need to do anything else. Look, I'm outside of the folder. If I type in crunch, I don't know, to to enter, it's going to start generating the passwords for me, which is amazing. Uh, however, I do wish to go back to that folder. Actually, I'm going to do that in the top topmost terminal because there is a character sets uh, there. There are character sets there. which I would very much like to take a look at, so, and you as well. So if I just type in cat char set LST, you will see that there are a lot of characters here. And do I have the command saved here so I don't have to retype it? Excellent, so I do. Let me just go ahead and expand this a little bit further so that you can see it a little bit better. Ah, I'm a perfectionist with these things. I like to have it symmetrical. I don't know why. Anyway, so you have uh, the 820 represents the length of the password. So beginning from eight characters, and eight characters is the minimal, and 20 is the maximum length of the password. Dash F, char set LST, mixed alphanumeric. This specifies which characters you wish to use. You can specify the characters manually. You can specify the certain positions as well, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. It says here mixed alphanumeric. So mixed alphanumeric. Let's go ahead and find mixed alphanumeric. Uh, mixed alphanumeric. There we go. So it should be uh, lowercase letters, capital letters, and numbers and that is what most passwords for wireless consist of i have seen a lot of them and i haven't seen i haven't seen many of them use any sort of symbols or characters or anything like that and usually if they do have a capital letter it's usually the first letter and everything else is lowercase and then numbers and it like at least 70 percent of all the passwords that i've seen uh did have that particular shape which makes our job a lot easier. I mean, yeah. However, if you just want to create all the possible combinations with alphanumeric, uh, with lowercase, uppercase letters and numbers, and if you wish for the minimal length of the password to be eight and for the maximum length of the password to be 20, uh, this will be bad for you. Look at this, press enter. Ah, right, 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 right. You need to specify the path to the char set. So if you just go into the folder and run it from there. Okay, I've interrupted it before it began. So it would take 8,321 8, petabytes of space. <laughs> that, is that is a ridiculous number. I mean, ridiculous. That, that, that's like a data center right there. 8,321 petabytes. So it's huge. You cannot possibly generate this and store it anywhere. It, it would be, I mean, you would need a stupid amount of space. Petabytes is enormous. Uh, go out onto the net if you want and look at the comparisons between petabytes, terabytes, and gigabytes. It's, uh, they differ a lot. Petabytes is a, is a lot. Anyway, as I said, 8,321 petabytes, that's probably the size, the storage size of a data center somewhere or something like that. And you're not going to be able to generate this and store it. Fortunately for us, uh, the method that I'm going to be using does not require us to actually store the password lists anywhere. They can be, as soon as they are generated, they are out, the output of crunch can be taken and it can be fed to the algorithm that is actually in charge of cracking the password. So we're gonna do that in the follow-up tutorial. I'll see you there. Okay, so welcome back. 
Now we're gonna go ahead and proceed with the installation of Hashcat. So go ahead and open up your browser. And, uh, type in Hashcat. Okay, go over to the Hashcat website. And you have two options here. You have the binaries and you have the source, source, sources. So you can definitely recompile it from the source code, but uh, you can just install the Hashcat binaries. So just click here, open with arc, okay. And then click extract to, extract to. I'm gonna extract mine to documents. So, okay, the process should be fairly fast. You can close it once it's done. And then let's go over to that place. Okay, so uh, uh, let's do it like this. So you have a bunch of things here and you don't really need to do much in terms of installation. It's just basically manually moving a bunch of files to designated places. Uh, let me sh let me show you. So ls uh, usr bin grep hash shy, and as you can see, I've actually have hashcat hashcat sixty four bin. Uh, dict stat hashcat stat hc tune induct log out files pod restore but some of these files are auto generated anyway let's go ahead and begin so the first thing that you need to do is type in cp hashcat and depending on whether forget about the exit part that's not for you uh just need the where is it Hashcat 64 bin. So if your system is 64 bit, you take this one. If it's 32 bit, you take this one. So just 64 bin. And you're going to be copying this to USR uh, bin directory. So it says overwrite. Sure, you can. I'm going to go ahead and overwrite it because I've already performed the installation one more time. And now, when you type in hash cat, you can gonna get 64 bin, but you don't really want to be typing in hash cat 64 bin every time you execute this. So let's go ahead and create ourselves a soft link. Uh, this is going to be sar bin uh, hash cat 64 bin, and then USR bin and the soft link will be hash cat. Okay, it says here fail to create because the file already exists. It's already there for me. But with this command, you create a hash cat basically shortcut. So you can type in when you use hash cat, you can just type in hash cat. You don't have to type in hash cat 64 uh, dot bin. It's a bit of a convenience, really, more than anything else. So that's kind of that's kind of nice. And there are a few more things that you will need to basically do. So you will also need to cp uh, opencl to usr bin. Uh, and it's a directory so you need like dash r and you can type in v for verbose mode and it says overwrite yes 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 i should have just said yes to all because this is uh hilarious i shouldn't have actually utilized the command because i already had it there but it's fine it's a bit of a clicking exercise and i wonder how many of them there are a lot of them <laughs> Okay, so you just you can see the drill. It's Y for yes. Should have just used the general Y to actually uh, 
Oh my god. Please. Have mercy on my soul. Come on. Why didn't I use the option to, like, forcefully just... Ah, never mind. I hope that you're enjoying this as much as I am. Me being stupid as usual. Okay, forget about this. I already have the file. There's way too many of them anyway. So this is what you need to do. So CP, RV, OpenCL, user, bin. Okay, so LS. What else do you need to copy? Well, you need to go ahead and copy the HC stat and HC tune. And if it, if it when you run Hashcat, if it complains that it's missing some things, we'll just come back to this file, find the missing things, and then copy them to user bin. So CP uh, uh, hashcat dot h c stat, and we're gonna do that user bin. Yes, and aside from h c stat, we also need another file. Let me just see where is it. Ah, uh, h c tune. Okay, so you're gonna need this one as well, and I do believe that that should really be it. When you run Hashcat, if it complains that it's missing something, just take a look at this directory here to which we have extracted it, and yeah, basically just copy it from there to the user bin, and it will find it by default. So, Hashcat, uh, okay, so apparently it's installed. Let's CD out of this directory and type in Hashcat, marvelous. It's actually installed. It is uh, up and running. So, I mean, it's it, it's it can see that it's installed if I type if I'm not in the folder. So if I type in hashcat dash dash help, you can see that I have a lot of these things and. In the follow-up tutorial, we'll actually do a bit of an explanation here and how it works, but Hashcat has a lot of options, so you can see it immediately has a device type, and the GPU is listed here. It has the char sets like Crunch has in that place. Uh, masks are also another interesting portion of uh, Hashcat as well, and as you can see, there are a ton load of options. But... Uh, since I'm going to need a bit of time to actually explain a lot of things here, I'm going to go ahead and have this done in the follow-up tutorial. But for now, you just know that it is installed because you can actually run it. We didn't run it to crack anything, but the program does run. Okay, so, uh, bid you a farewell. Welcome back, everybody. So, my DNS proxy is running. The only thing that I have changed here is the domain. So I went ahead and I've actually registered the domain, uh, erminkrepunch.com, my first name, last name. So www.erminkrepunch.com. And this domain will probably be down by the time I actually publish this video. This is the IP address as before of my virtual machine where the web server is running. And I went ahead and I created a website that's and created a web server that is basically tied to this domain and the static IP is there. And I've also uh, bought an SSL certificate just so that I can demonstrate how this principle works. So this is running, the wireless access point is running and my victim machine is actually connected to the is connected to that wireless access point. Now, as I said before a hundred times, you do not require this victim machine. You can use your cell phone, you can use your other machine, your house, a laptop, whatever, tablet, doesn't really matter. And uh, here is the site that I'm going to do tests with. 
The reason for me actually creating this site is due to the fact that I can't really use any of the social media uh, web servers or their domains or anything like that. I cannot compromise them in any way. Well, primarily because I don't have a permission and it's illegal. So I have created my own domain. I've created my own website. And I know what you're going to say. Oh, remember, but your website is so simple. The content of the site are, they are completely irrelevant. You can have anything here. You can have a hundred pictures. You can have videos, whatever. I've just created the basic of the basic content for the site because the content of the site is completely irrelevant. Uh, what is important is to bypass SSL. Once we actually manage to bypass SSL, the content of the site is irrelevant because once this, once the traffic can be decrypted, it doesn't matter what's on the site, you'll be able to see everything. So the content, once again, they're completely irrelevant. This is just for testing purposes that I have created for you guys. So I've actually registered a domain, brought up a web server on, in the cloud, and, impo and bought an SSL certificate as well. So this is a legit SS HTTPS uh, connection. Uh, certificate has been imported functioning the traffic between me and this site is encrypted this is not a self-signed certificate this is something that if you go here uh, it says verified by komodo ca limited so this is a real this is a real ssl certificate that i have purchased and this is not something that i've created and self-signed so this is the real deal anyway I have not configured this web server to go for the HSTS, where the HTTPS protocol is strictly enforced, whereby no uh, HTTP connections are actually possible. But rather instead, I have just left it at HTTPS. That's going to be the first part of this, uh, of this demo. The second part is where we will actually go and see what we can do about the HSTS. Then I will reconfigure the server for HSTS, and then we'll see what happens there. Now, look, even though this site is HTTPS, right? It's clearly HTTPS, there you have a lock here. I'm gonna go to my victim machine and open up a web browser. And I can and I shall type in www. And here I've already opened it before, and I shall press enter. And it's loading. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, it's proxying the responses. That's nice. And there you go. It takes me to the fake site. It says here, fake site. How? Where did this fake site come from? Well, on the Kali machine, I have created another site, which is the exact copy of the one I have, which is the exact copy of the real site, except for the fact that in the title, it says fake site. So uh, let me just do cat var. Don't worry, I will show you how to copy websites. I'll, I'll literally show you a tool which you can use in order to copy an entire website. You won't need to do this manually. HTML, index.html, and you can see that this is the entirety of the site. It doesn't matter, it says username and password, input, input. It doesn't actually go anywhere. And here it just says fake site while uh, here it says real site. So I just placed those two small differences so that you could tell. And take a, take a look at this. It's not HTTPS at all. Uh, it's HTTP regardless. So this technique that I am employing with the DNS redirections actually works on a vast amount of HTTPS sites. So it doesn't matter if a site is HTTPS or HTTP, this is going to work. As I said, I, this is not a self-signed certificate uh, for this for this site. This is a real certificate. And now that I basically have this, now that there is a redirection on the on the client on the victim machine to this site, whatever the user types in here, I will be able to sniff out and see on the network how that is done. I will also show you, of course. But this is, this is the most important part, to get rid of the HTTPS. So that's the primary problem. Once you're rid of that, and once the traffic is going over your network, grabbing the actual traffic is a piece of cake, basically. That's very easy. So my technique, 
well, I can't, I don't know, it's not actually my technique, it's the technique that was invented that I am just demonstrating here, uh, works. So it works for HTTPS sites, it doesn't work for all HTTPS sites, but it works for a vast amount of them. Now, I am able to protect myself against this if I reconfigure the web server hosting the real site to redirect all connections on port 80 to port 443. Once that happens, and once I actually implement the protocols, once I actually put the lines of code to enforce the HTTPS no matter what, then this vector of attack will no longer be possible. How we will bypass that, we'll see in part two, but before that, let's go ahead and see how we can grab the username and password on this site. And by the way, uh, this technique can also work for pretty much any other website. There are no real differences between this site and any other site out there aside from the looks, but the web ser you're trying you're not trying to compromise the site itself through the content of the site, but rather instead you're trying to compromise the encryption of the site. Once that is compromised, you basically can do whatever you want with the traffic that goes over your network. Okay, so I'm gonna bid you uh, farewell here and we shall see each other in the follow-up tutorial where I will show you how to actually take the credentials and then we will go into the HSTS. If you've made it to this point in the video, I'm willing to bet that you are hungry for more knowledge. Upon enrolling in the complete ethical hacking course on Udemy, you will immediately receive an additional seven and a half hours of HD video. And this is just the beginning. We plan on making monthly updates to the course based on student feedback, but you can find video tutorials anywhere. You can find them on YouTube, you can find them all over the internet. So what makes this Udemy course really worth taking? The answer is the Q&A or discussion forum within the course. We will answer every single one of your questions within the course and we won't stop until we solve whatever it is you're having issues with. So as you can see, if we open up this question, there are 30 responses to this student's question. This is value you will find nowhere else on the net. So go ahead and use coupon code JDYT25 and get 87% off the list price for this course. I will include a link in the description. I will include timestamps to this video and I will also include links to subscribe to myself and Ehrman's channel. So thank you for taking the time to watch this and we hope to see you in the course.